In this episode, we discuss the application of artificial intelligence and distributed computing at the industrial age. We talk about connectivity technologies like Eclipse Xeno, Cyclone DDS, and Zetascale. My guest on this episode is Angelo Cozaro. Angelo is CEO and CTO at Zetascale, a company working to bring every human and machine unconstrained freedom to communicate, compute, and store anywhere at any scale efficiently and securely. Up until recently, Angelo was CTO at ADLink, a company that provides edge software and hardware for building and deploying edge AI solutions and has been at the cutting edge of embedded computing and innovative technologies for over 25 years. Previously, Angelo worked as CTO at Prism Tech and he was also at the Object Management Group, an international technology standards consortium where he was co-chair of the Data Distribution Services Project and also a member board of directors. Angelo holds a PhD in Computer Science from Washington University in St. Louis. A quick thank you to our sponsors. This episode is made possible by our friends at HiveMQ who are providers of an enterprise-grade edge and cloud-based MQTT broker. I use it for my own IoT applications and they have a free cloud version that allows you to connect up to 100 devices. So please do check it out to help support this podcast. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry 4 TV, which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So if you are new here, please make sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the interviews. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kutai Mandi Teresa. Now, here's my interview with Angelo. Okay, so Angelo, I uh, would like to welcome you to the fourth generation uh, podcast here on Industry 4 TV. And today, I would like to talk to you about edge computing, artificial intelligence at the edge, and also Zeta scale. So, welcome. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be on this podcast. Thank you for the invitation. Great. Okay, so to get started, uh, I think we need to first establish a, a clear understanding uh, of what edge computing is and how it is related to, to, to cloud computing. So what's your take on that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point because uh, as you know, I mean, this, uh, in this domain, there are various different definitions. And uh, I mean, in industry or academia, there aren't two people that roughly define edge computing exactly the same way. And I think there is also a reason for that, um, because if you look at from where edge computing emerged, and then how eventually, uh, you know, what used to be fog computing and uh, what used to be edge computing converged, um, you know, that created some some confusion and different perspective. But hopefully, you know, we will try to uh, set that straight and uh, and set it clear for the listeners of this podcast. So, but let's start with the genesis because I think it's very important to know where we're coming from right, to understand why sometimes there are so many different definitions of fog, edge, and so on and so forth. So let's, you know, take the time machine. Let's go back in roughly 2014, early 2014, and uh, let's see what was happening back then. Back then, you know, we were at the apex of cloud computing. Uh, We had already, you know, hype on IoT, consumer IoT, and most of those um, applications were embracing a cloud-centric architecture, meaning that uh, you know, they were considering roughly not so powerful or not so intelligent devices on the periphery of the system, although some of those devices were indeed quite powerful, but still assuming that were, they were quite limited. And, as, and uh, no, having an architecture based on which the center of the universe is the cloud, you push everything to the cloud, and that's where you know storage happens, where computation happens, and so on and so forth. So at the moment in time, there were really two community that started struggling with this architecture. And uh, one of the two community were the telecommunication. And the telecommunication that started to struggling initially in the context of mobile um, communications. And in fact, there was an initiative here in Europe driven from Etsy 
uh, and some member of our team were chairing some of those sub sub teams called MEC. And I know perhaps few people will recall that MEC originally stand for mobile edge computing. And the entire idea of MEC was, okay, how can we reduce the latency of you know, mobile application when interacting with the network so that you know, depending on the content they're looking for or you know, whatever they're trying to do, they don't need to get down to the back office, but they, you know, what they require to be done can be intercepted by some infrastructure that is on the boundary of the network. And so in the context of a telco provider, edge computing made lots of sense because the edge is very well defined, okay? Yeah. And so that's where edge computing started emerging. Eventually, you know, they, they went away from a mobile edge computing into multi-access edge computing, which is what is used today. And roughly just about the same time, um, other teams coming more from the IT world they also realized that if we wanted to address what you know used to what was emerging as the industrial internet of things cloud centric architecture couldn't work why well because in some case you know we didn't have enough bandwidth to push all the data to the cloud um, in some other cases um, you know there were some application which you really didn't want to push the data to the cloud because that was strategic data that you want to keep on premises in other cases I mean, we couldn't ensure, especially in mobility application, that we would have connectivity all the time or in some agricultural application that we've been uh, um, you know, very closely collaborating with. You know, uh, if you have autonomous tractor driving on a field, you can't assume that they have a good internet connection to be directed by cloud. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, in the context of industrial internet of thing, people started saying, well, actually, you know, the cloud is too far. We need more infrastructure closer to the things, okay? And, uh, you know, we were involved with uh, the, the Fog Computing uh, core team. Uh, the first paper came, uh, came out of Cisco. We were working with, with, with that team led by Flavio Bonomi. And, um, and actually I was one of the people that helped defining as part of the open uh, Fog consortium, what Fog Computing is. And back then we defined, look, Fog Computing is really about providing an infrastructure for having application that can seamlessly operate, right? Be provisioned, be monitored and managed and so on and so forth from the cloud to device continuum. And this is really the definition that I take of edge computing today. So for me, edge computing in the general market is not about drawing an edge because that edge you know, makes some sense in one domain like telco yeah. But, you know, from domain A to domain B, those ages are different. So if you want to build a platform that is capable of supporting as many verticals as possible, the reality is that edge company is about, okay, you pick where is the edge, but our technology makes sure that you can provision, monitor, communicate, you know, efficiently, effectively, and in an unconstrained manner from the data center down to the microcontroller. So this is the definition that I like of edge computing. Um, we use edge computing because, you know, that's the, the mainstream term that is used today. But when we say edge computing, we really think cloud to thing continuum. That's quite interesting. Now, as far as industrial uh, automation uh, is concerned, uh, what would you say are the uh, opportunities and, and benefits of, of uh, having a, a platform like edge computing where, where you could run some intelligence? Yeah, so uh, this is useful in several different aspects because... And if you think just about um, basic industrial automation, um, and we could make similar example for warehouse, as of today, production, um, it's, or, you know, it's quite localized to a center. There is some level of, you know, let's say business integration, but the actual production, okay? And the information about the production is very much localized and I would say encapsulated, um, or maybe we could use the term trapped, okay? Yeah. Because encapsulation for people in computer science has a good connotation. Trapped is really what, what they really mean within a factory. And so the first step really to be able to optimize certain of the production um, parameters is to you know, free this data and make it possible for certain of the uh, production data to be freely shared uh, between different factories 
um, and to unlock the possibility of doing more global optimization as opposed to local optimization. And uh, just this, that sounds very simple, actually is causing a major disruption in industrial automation because from a traditional SCADA architecture that you might be familiar, the four or five layers of a SCADA, which is very hierarchical and with you know, very clear boundaries, we are really moving away from, from that architecture to something that is more like a graph in which potentially you know, I can access field floor information of factory A from factory B and so on and so forth. So that's really the first step of unlocking the information that would allow us then to do you know, much more, um, I would say, global coordination and at the same time, you know, taking better local decision. And so once again, uh, by knowing what is happening in other centers. And again, as of today, if you want to do this, you would have to consolidate all the data within a cloud and have that intelligence in the cloud. And if we are, you know, unlock the data and make it possible to, to understand where it makes sense to receive which portion of data, we can redistribute those decisions uh, without losing infidelity in the decision that we take toward the edge. Oh, okay. This uh, makes quite a lot of sense, actually. So now, uh, I don't know if you remember, we, we, we participated on a panel together for the uh, developer survey at the Eclipse uh, Foundation. And one of the uh, statistics that were there was the fact that artificial intelligence is, is like the most popular workload that is being run at the, at the edge. You know? So yeah. I'm curious to find out, could you have, uh, provide us with example applications of uh, artificial intelligence uh, at the edge uh, as far as industrial is concerned? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I recall very well yeah. the fun podcast we had together. So, I mean, in our experience, uh, the actual, perhaps the, the earliest, and, and that was already quite a few years ago, um, use case that we had on, uh, on Edge AI were related to computer vision. Okay. okay. And so uh, we, we worked on, um, um, on some uh, uh, use cases in which uh, uh, essentially we were working on uh, um, defect detection by using high resolution images of certain devices and then um, you know, running some, some AI algorithm on those. Um, so that was one example. Um, but there are other examples in which um, we had far less, I would say, sophisticated use of artificial intelligence uh, to detect, for instance, um, or to predict failure on a production line. And that's very important because if you're in production, um, I mean, I know this will sound insane, but in many of the major manufacturers, often today, they don't have visibility of when one element in a production line is down. So I'm not meaning predicting that it will be down and yeah. really meaning telling you that it's down. Yes. And so uh, it, it was interesting because then you say, hold on, but that, that's trivial to detect. Well, it's trivial if you can observe. But actually, as there are so many um, legacy machinery, and as you typically cannot connect to their operational network, you have an observability problem. And so even in that cases, we started using some artificial intelligence technique very creatively you know, from com computer vision to OCR and other weird things to try to, in a non-invasive manner, detect when machines weren't working and provide this information to the operator so that they could fix it and resume the, um, the, uh, the production line. Um, I mean, these are probably the most creative uh, project we had to do because, you know, we couldn't access the, the machine. We, we, we didn't have any rights to you know, connect to the machine through Modbus or anything else. Uh, we could watch the screen, okay? Yeah. And uh, anything, the only things we could do is perhaps observe uh, the, uh, the signal coming from the video card of that machine and whatever was coming from the operator, keyboard and mouse. That was it, okay? And so that's probably one of the most interesting projects we did. Then we did, um, a various project on um, edge robotics. So that's another application where we see artificial intelligence used quite a bit. And that's mostly in the, either for um, planning 
um, or for uh, cobots, so human to robot collaboration. But that's probably if you know beyond vision, uh, that's one of the area where we see most of the of the AI being used today. Okay, and when I say robot, well, I, I mean you no. Know, what typically people think about robots, right? Uh, but I also extend that to autonomous navette and so on and so forth. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I mean, uh, from the use cases that you've just uh, uh, provided to us here, it's quite clear that you've, you've had an extensive uh, hands-on experience with the implementation of um, uh, intelligence at the edge. Now, yeah. fr from your experience, uh, what would you say are the biggest challenges when it comes to uh, the implementation of uh, intelligent edge computing, uh, particularly in the industrial automation space? It's the data, <laughs> okay? And again, I would like to make a parallel. You know, if you think about the human body, everyone is fascinated by the brain because the brain is indeed incredibly fascinating. And um, how many people care about the nervous system? Very few. Yeah. Right? Because in the end, is it cool? Do you see it? Uh, not much. But what if the nervous system doesn't work? Nothing else works. In order for our brain, our brain works, thanks God, because we have a nervous system that brings information to it. And so the biggest challenge that you have in implementing edge AI is actually dealing with the data and dealing intelligent with the data. And uh, this is actually you know, one of the area that we decided to tackle because that's where we saw there was a huge gap, okay? okay. And what is the gap? Again, recall that most of the, the AI technology that exists today, right, were geared toward the data center. Yeah. As soon as you want to do edge intelligence, that already means that you have to storage data in a geo-distributed manner. And you have, you know, and, and that already started introduces some complexities. You have to efficiently exchange the data and exploit locality. You know, in harsh environment, sometimes with very um, limited bandwidth. So there were quite a few of challenges, and uh, those were some of the key challenges that we decided to you know, take upon us when designing and working on some of the open source projects that we are leading in Eclipse, such as Eclipse Zeno, for instance. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. We're going to touch a bit on uh, Eclipse in a bit later uh, uh, on this talk. But that, uh, give, that gives uh, essentially the idea that, you know, the brain, we have, I think, good brains today. Obviously, there has been part of quite some work to try to, you know, improve the existing AI algorithm to run on uh, more embedded target. But the problem today was really on the nervous system. Okay, and again, so people always get attention or interested in the brain, but you know, if the nervous system doesn't work, nothing else works. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Well, I guess that's a that's a nice segue to 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 go into the uh, uh, our next topic here because like um, most of our audience here are architects and and, and engineers, yeah. so uh, I'm sure they'll be curious to find out um, typically how would you uh, go about putting a, an architecture, an edge AI architecture, and what is the required infrastructure for for implementing such a solution in manufacturing? Okay, so. Um... Uh, typically, what we do, okay, and I think the, the, the secret sauce, as I mentioned before, is having the right split of computation. What do I mean? Or computation and communication, right? Because as I meant before, um, I mean, usually closest to where the data is, uh, especially if you're in an harsh environment, inevitably, you have a um, little bit less capable hardware, okay? But still, you have some compu uh, computing, um, some opportunity for executing computing. And so, I mean, and it's interesting because we do a, a hackathon in, uh, in some school every year to, to really let students touch this with their hands. Because the trick for scaling out is essentially making sure that any computation that you can leverage throughout the network to reduce the volume of data, okay, you do it. So I'll just give you a, a trivial example. Suppose we are doing face recognition, okay? So fa face recognition, um, you know, uh, if you try to run it on, uh, on an arm M, not good idea. But perhaps you can do face extraction on a relatively powerful arm M, okay? okay. Or, or something like a Raspberry Pi. 
And, and that already allows you uh, to do face extraction and just distributing the face to be recognized to reduce the bandwidth immensely, okay? So my, the, the key lesson is really think about, you know, wherever you can execute computation and how you can leverage the computation to then reduce the amount of data that, that is in, uh, on the fly. So that's the first aspect. Second aspect is think very carefully where are the optimus, optimal place where you want to store the data. So for instance, if we take as an example, again, the face recognition, um, you typically receive a set of face, receive a set of face, and then you, know, you run them through a neural network and then we'll create typically a vector of 128 point. I, I don't know if you're aware, but the way in which this algorithm work is that they detect 128 point in your face, and then you do essentially distant neighbor with, a, with, a, with your database of 128 a point, right? To find the best match. But that's a database, right? That I will have to use in order to detect faces. And so how am I going to scale this out? Again, I don't have a cloud, right? And so am I going to have a single uh, server that does face recognition for everything? And I'm, am I going to have is a geo-distributed series of databases that does this? Do I add some, some hierarchy? So all of that also becomes quite important. And I think I will come back to the, the key point that, you know, make sure that you use technology that give you the right flexibility. So don't get forced into an architecture that doesn't make sense for your system, because this is what happens sometimes today, right? Yeah. We think that, you know, the only way is to, to be cloud-centric. And, um, you know, sometimes that uh, leads not to have necessarily good performance because of all the um, decentralization that that induces. But uh, again, with the proper decentralization, the proper division of labor, in our experience, right, you can, uh, you know, uh, have systems that are more resilient, okay, because they are not relying on a single point of failure, um, that are more efficient, right, both in terms of time to detect in that case that the phase um, and far more modular, okay? So I think those are the, the, the key element that I, that I would say. And the other things that I would say is that for anyone who is based in France, we run a hackathon at Central, Central Supelec, which is the, one of the top five engineering schools here in France every June with several, uh, you know, around 80, 80 people. And any of you interested, we can invite you. Um, up to last year, we did um, um, uh, edge computer vision yeah. and tracking, okay? okay? And this year will be mostly about edge robotics, okay? So, and, and it's precisely to show how the ability of decentralizing make it easier to build systems that work. And this is what people really touch when, when we run this hackathon in collaboration with, uh, with this grand call. Oh, okay, that's quite some interesting um, uh, project that you've got going on there. I'm sure we'll have a lot of people who are interested in finding out more about that. We're going to uh, obviously include a link uh, uh, to, to, to more information uh, at the, in the description of this talk. Yeah. Now, well, you've, you've um, as you have stated, or from how I understand it, uh, edge computing really is about, it's mostly about uh, being closer to the source of data and acting on the data as it, as it is being produced to limit the amount of data that goes um, uh, uh, to the cloud or, or, or elsewhere as it were, and also have this distributed kind of approach to it. Now, but at the same time, the, the, the cloud is sort of like uh, an easier approach for, for most companies. Some of them, they, they have some data that is stored in a data lake in the cloud. Some of them, they do send some data for storage in the cloud. So having said that, uh, are there any possibilities or what are the possible approaches there for, for big data driven edge to cloud collaboration uh, in, in such a, a scenario? Okay, so that's, that's a good question. And I think what makes things are today, okay, I would argue that is the lack of location transparency for that at rest. What do I mean with that? So let, let me try to explain. So today with data in movement, Okay, we have a plethora of technologies, right? I mean, MQTT, DDS, Xeno, whatever, okay? That allow you, that, that follow the PubSub uh, paradigm and essentially allow you to express interest in data and receive that data without having awareness 
of the location that is producing that data. That's very, that's sometimes underestimated, but it's very powerful, okay? Mm-hmm. Because all of a sudden, you know, I could be a subscriber sitting next to you or on the other side of the world. I don't need to know that. I still receive your data, okay? And so we have this location transparency that is super important for distributed system. But something that we have given, we have accepted that given for granted for some times is that as soon this data stops moving and it's stored in a data store, you lose location transparency. All of a sudden, I need to know where the data is stored, okay? Yes. And so to your point, either the data is stored on the edge or it's stored in the cloud, or I need to know that I have to store it in both places. And then how are they aligned? And why just in this data store on the edge and not three data store on the edge and on the cloud? That's a big problem. And this is, by the way, one of the things that we uh, that, that that was a big pain for us was a big pain for many of our end user, and we decided to address within Zeno. Okay, so what we did in Zeno, we tried to to blend um, the state of the art, obviously in PubSub technology, and go beyond the state of the art and state of the art name data networking to ensure that we we could provide as a single frame or something to have location transparency for data in motion but also location transparency for data at rest. And in fact, in Zeno, we are able to issue distributed query and address storages in spite of the fact that they are on the cloud, you know, on, the, on my own machine or on some, uh, you know, server just uh, on the same local area network. And that's quite powerful because all of a sudden, I don't need to know anymore where the data is stored, right? I just can issue query and it's that Zeno protocol that ensures that it crawls the network and retrieves the data from the closest um, data store. And you can do that integrating you know, your favorite databases because you know, there are lots of very good databases. We didn't want to, um, to reinvent databases. We just wanted you to have a way of anywhere on the network, be able not just to inject data into these databases, but to query them without knowing where the data is while having you know, the ability for doing load balancing, uh, fault tolerance, and uh, having the right level of consistency too. Now, well, now that you mentioned uh, Zeno, so maybe first of all, for some of the audience here who might not be familiar, uh, uh, you are heavily involved in uh, two open source projects at the Eclipse yeah. Foundation, right? One of which is Zeno, which you have just uh, given us a, a highlight of, and also there is uh, Eclipse uh, Cyclone DDS. Absolutely. Uh, could you just give our audience a brief introduction into of course. these projects and of maybe course. highlight also where they fit in this edge computing time scale? Absolutely. So let's start with Cyclone DDS, okay? Yeah. Um, because I've already mentioned a couple of times Zeno. So let's start with Cyclone. So Cyclone DDS, as the name um, imply, uh, it's an implementation of the DDS standard, okay? So the DDS standard, DDS stands for Data Dis- Distribution Service. This is a standard from the UMG. I was actually one of the three people that started the uh, standardization group back in 2003, I believe, and was active as a co-chair of the group up to 2000, uh, early 2016. Then I decided that you know it was long enough. I was working on that and someone yeah. else on, on my company um, sh- should take over, which, which happened. And so, the, the, what is DDS and why is relevant for this kind of system? Well, DDS was emerged to address really uh, high performance, real time communication on local air network. Okay, and so historically was used in application um, close to aerospace in medical, um, but in the past few years it has received lots of attention and momentum in robotics and automotive, okay? So many of you or some of you perhaps know that DDS is used at the foundation of the ROS2 um, uh, framework. ROS stands for Robotic Operating System, but really is a framework uh, for facilitating the development of um, a robotic application. And um, um, for those of you that have heard about the India Autonomous Challenge, and for those of you that haven't, I suggest you take a look take a look at it. Again, we, we, we might be able to provide the, we will provide the link. Um, uh, Cyclone was the DDS implementation used uh, 
by every single team that competed within the Indian Autonomous Challenge. Why? Because it was the one giving the best performance, was the one giving the best determinism, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, in a way that uh, summarizes the goal that we had when we started Eclipse Cyclone, uh, the Eclipse Cyclone project, which is you know, to create you know, the DDS implementation of reference. So we wanted to make sure that the community had the DDS implementation that was the best performing, the most feature rich, and the one you know, with the best and, and most open and welcoming community supporting it. So we have experienced you know, very good rate of adoption. Um, the, the product, I mean, I think the, the, best, uh, you know, the best test is just try it and try to break it. Yeah. But very often, you know, we hear from, our, from, from the community, look, I was using DDS X, Y, Z, and I had this problem. I switched to Cyclone, it works. And that's, you know, for us, the most beautiful things to hear. Um, so again, Cyclone DDS, it's simple to position because it's a DDS implementation. Um, DDS has some very well-defined application domain. And our goal, it's also very simple, which is be simply the best, okay? We don't uh, want any, 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 any lower than that, okay? And we're working very hard toward it. Um, and Zeta Scale, um, which maybe we'll, we'll touch upon, um, as we'll have a, a key role in really accelerating, you know, f the, the, for the development and the, the success and the adoption of, um, of Cyclone DDS. Now, if we remain on, um, uh, on DDS, I think DDS sets the good premises of why we did Zeno, okay? So DDS, as I mentioned, I was very closely involved with, with a standard and the standard came up in 2003, which is roughly 20 years ago. Long time. Yeah, so yeah, that tells a lot about how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, yeah. let's not talk about that. Yeah. Um, but um, okay, so essentially, as I, DDS was very much designed for systems that uh, were mostly operating over a local error network, which means you know, low packet loss, availability of multicast. Uh, and roughly symmetric systems and relatively resourceful. And so uh, the, the, the things that um, were rather complicated in DDS uh, without you know, coming up as some the vendor have done with something that they call DDS, but isn't DDS, okay? But then everyone is free to do whatever they want. But what was complicated was to, to expand it to reach really small things like small microcontroller, like an Arduino, okay? or to make it scale out to wide error network. And why? I mean, I don't say, I don't talk hypothetically. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had product, um, product that are deployed in some customer that were trying and actually were, you know, uh, to some extent succeeding uh, scaling DDS across a wide error network, but it was a pain. It was a pain because of some of the key assumptions that DDS makes and some of the key mechanism of the protocol. So in order to make it scalable, you had to break some of those assumptions and those assumptions leak up to the API level. So you were, you were forced to break the semantics if you wanted something that really scales or have something that doesn't scale. So that was one of the motivation for us to say, look, I mean, we want to come up with a protocol that can really address the cloud two uh, things uh, continuum going down to the device and internet scale um, you know, we don't want to suffer all the compromise of a standard, a compromise because there are multiple vendors, there are, you know, 20 years, it's a lot of deployed system. So that limits the amount of things you can change. And so, you know, that was one of the, of the reasons why we did Zeno. The other reason, as I mentioned and briefly touched before, is because we realized that one of the pain that our customer had and that we were having with them was really to deal with geo-distributed storages. So the ability to store data wherever it makes sense for it to be, but then transparently query it wherever you are in the network. And so that's what really Zeno did. And so Zeno is actually a very young project because in terms of Eclipse Zeno, uh, although we are the third, uh, let's say generation Zeno, but before you know, was like an internal project in, in AD-Link, okay? Yeah. Eventually we decided to open source as part of the rewriting Rust, because as we care a lot about security, Zen is entirely written in Rust. 
Um, Zenwa as, as an eclipse project is one year and a half, but I believe if you look in terms of stars and the activity that we have on our guitar channel is one of the fastest growing project on, on eclipse. And in terms of adoption, um, you know, we have some, some pretty strong adoption in uh, anything that has to do with robot to robot and robot infrastructure communication. So R2X, same things for vehicle V2X, uh, both in cars as well as in trains and so on and so on and so forth. And, um, and then, I mean, it's interesting because usually people start using Zeno because of its performance and its wear efficiency. And it's only afterwards that they realize the true power of Zeno uh, in building distributed system. And a couple of weeks ago, a guy said, but I just have realized that Zeno is like a completely distributed version of Kafka. He said, <laughs> yeah, you can also use that way. And with that, you understand the power that it gives you in terms of distributed AI, right? Oh, okay, that's that's quite interesting. So I remember because I'm actually still also in the uh, research uh, uh, phase of trying to 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 understand Zeno, and I I I remember coming across somewhere where it said you could integrate MQTT into Zeno. Can you talk about that integration? How do these how do, yeah. do these two come together? Yeah, and by the way, so Zeno is a protocol. So and that's again another difference with with, uh, with DDS that in fact can sit on top of layer two. So that means that Zeno does its own routing. And as such, um, our router have a plugin system where we can integrate any third party technology, either being it a storage technology that then we query or a messaging technology like DDS, MQTT, AMQP, you name it. And so we did, for instance, a DDS plugin and we have quite a few user that use DDS over the robots but then all the tail operation and the R2X, as it's usually called, is through Zeno. And it's completely transparent. And more importantly, for how our bridge work, uh, you're able even to interact with your robot through the Zeno API, which are you know, quite, quite simple. And so the interesting things with MQTT is that in terms of topology, MQTT supports up and spoke. To, um, up and spoke. So you have, a, you have a, a broker, you connect to the broker, but there is no broker to broker protocol. So if you have a very large system, how do you scale? Either you scale up, so you have more powerful machine, or you get into a proprietary solution. And so with our MQTT plugin for Zeno, all of a sudden you can leverage the Zeno routing network to route MQTT across the globe, which is very powerful. Yeah, that's... And even more importantly, you could have you know, an application that does MQTT subscribing to topic produced by Zeno application and a DDS application, and all of that works together. Oh, and I mean, we, we were showing this, and, and again, you know, you have NQTT, you have DDS, you have some Zeno. You want to store data produced by NQTT, but then and some by or by DDS. You just by administration provision the storage that you want, okay, yeah. to achieve the right level of replication, to achieve the right locality, and that's completely transparent. And from anywhere in the network, you can query those storages using the Zeno, the Zeno API. Oh, okay, that's quite. Fascinating, I must say. Yeah, well, so the, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is uh, Zeta Scale, right? So, which is a, an AD link offshoot that is uh, headed by yourself. Correct. Uh, yeah. yeah. Could you give us an introduction to Zeta Scale, what it is, why it exists, yeah, and some of the so, key concepts? So, Zeta Scale uh, is, is a spin off of the AD Link Advanced Technology Office. So in AD Link, I, I was the CTO in AD Link and I had the, you know, the honor and the pleasure to run the Advanced Technology Office, which was the unit looking at um, you know, what's next. Okay. And so, and we were looking at what, what's next for software and the boundary between software and hardware. So we're doing also some hardware related research, but the portion that we spin off is really the part that is related to, to software. And why did we decide to spin off? Well, we decided to spin off because you now we are seeing our technologies, uh, so Eclipse uh, Cyclone and Eclipse Zeno, growing in adoption incredibly, right? Uh, we think that there is a huge market opportunity. And so we decided you know, to create an entity that has the right level of funding, the right focus and a brand, right? Uh, and a mission uh, to really pursue that market and making sure, no, making sure, let's say, put all of all of our will and effort, right, uh, to make this, this really successful. 
Um, so Zeta Scale is, is is still uh, you know young as a company because we were spin off. We, we officially uh, started as a operating as a standalone entity in this January, and uh, but our ambition are big as the name reveals because Zeta uh, is ten to the twenty one. And so the reason why we call the company Zeta Scale is because, you know, Peta Scale was the big subject in data center. And we think to the, go to the next level of scale, you have to decentralize okay. and thus embrace our technology and thus Zeta Scale. <laughs> okay. So that's the meaning of the name. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. So are they like... Um... For some of the people in the audience who are still trying to grasp the whole uh, idea of uh, Zeta Scale, uh, what would you say are the compelling use cases of uh, Zeta Scale in, in, in manufacturing? Okay, so what we do, okay, so if I was to, to summarize our mission, yeah. our mission is to provide technology that, that allow you know, any device or human the unconstrained freedom to communicate store and compute from the data center or the cloud to the device. So if we go back to my analogy of the nervous system, yeah. Zeta scale gives you the nervous system for edge computing. And once you have that very solid infrastructure, okay, that glues everything together, um, both in terms of data exchange, in terms of storages, and in terms of actually computation, because this is something we didn't touch upon, you just have to decide, you know, and to develop your business logic, and uh, you know all the rest is there. So we give you the nervous system, you implement the brain, and you are in business. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense actually. Okay, so now uh, when it comes to industrial edge computing uh, in general, uh, what are the most prominent security threats that you've come across and um, what are the countermeasures to to it? Yeah. So, uh, okay. Good. Good question. And uh, we could spend hours talking about this. So, first of all, you know, uh, the the things where where we are very careful is how we write our code. Okay. So we recently, for instance, collaborated with Trend Micro. Um, to not, not only give them full access to our sources, but really help them try to break our software, okay? And there is a report that was um, that they published, there was a, a paper published recently at the Black Hat conference in, in which they showed that in fact, our software, you know, had just one vulnerabilities in, uh, you know, XML parser that was used for some configuration which is very good news, okay? Mm -hmm. And we were very happy that they found some vulnerabilities because, you know, every vulnerability that is found, it's a chance for you to fix it. So the first things that we do with respect to security is using programming languages, okay? Like Rust, um, and that's true for Xeno. Cyclone is written in C, but then, you know, we run lots of uh, static analysis and uh, FADs in software to, to make sure that, uh, you know, we are safe. But the, the, the first place where we start is really with code quality and ensuring that an entire set of bugs are that then create uh, security uh, issues are either not possible because of the programming language we use, does Rust, or you know, we, we do the proper analysis to, to rule them out. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. The second step, you know, in the protocol that we design, we try to make sure that we limit all the potential for denial of service attack. And let me give you a very simple example. Whenever you try to establish a session, okay, if, and, and there are, I mean, I don't want to, I will talk for our technology, I don't want to, you know, pinpoint bugs or security issue in other technology, but people that know those will, will learn immediately how to do denial of service attack. But a very simple example to do a denial of service attack is that I start establishing session with you, okay? I, I, I craft lots of open packets, but then I never, you know, uh, go to the end of, of my session, okay? And if your infrastructure is maintaining some, uh, some state about that session, eventually you will run out of memory or you will degrade your performance, okay? So in our case, for instance, we have protocol, uh, or if we take as an example, the Xeno protocol, 
the session opening for Zeno protocol is stateless. Okay, why? Because essentially, just to give a, a hint to, 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 to the listeners, you try to open a session with me, I don't keep any state. I'll give you back a cookie encrypted that has the state that they need to know about you. Okay. Right. But I remain clean like a baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see? Yes, yes, so, yes. so we are very careful. Uh, again, in the coding, we are very careful in the design. Um, you know, we use the, we, we try, I mean, we, we care a lot about security and we're also very open about it. So, I mean, anybody that can break our system, I mean, we are just happy because, you know, as I said, it's one bug less to, to resolve. Yeah. Um, and again, something can always slip into, but, uh, you know, we are very meticulous in making sure that both structurally for what, how we code, as well as in terms of the protocol that we use and then the security architecture uh, or security technology that we use, everything is fine. Now, there is, but that's not all because something that is not widely discussed is how you make security scalable. Okay. okay. Because if you think about um, traditional security with private and public keys and um, you know certificate authentication so on and so forth, I mean, at scale, it's, it's very complicated to deploy and operate, okay? okay? And so something else that, um, I mean, actually it's already implementable as a, as a, at the library level, but we plan to, to, for instance, support natively in Xeno is the concept, and, and I'll explain it in, in, in abstract terms, okay? So in general, in security, you protect access, okay? And then if you get access, the data is non-encrypted. So that's the usual modus operandi, but it's very, very hard to do that at scale. So if you flip the problem, you say, you know what? I mean, it's very hard to protect access. So why, instead of protecting access, how about we just make sure that, I mean, we, we just don't care. We make sure that everyone can get whatever they want, but only the people that are authorized uh, can decrypt the content, okay? Yeah. So this is something also we're working on. We think it's a far more scalable way of achieving security. Uh, it has some other challenges, especially for, um, you know, when some access control rule changes and so on and so forth. But uh, this is just to tell you that security is very close to our art. Um, you know, we are looking at, uh, you know, let's say, a creative way of introducing scalability in our product. And, um, and, and that's for what concerns us. For what then concerns the market, it's kind of weird because, I mean, if you recall also about the, the developer survey, security is always a concern. Everyone yeah. asks, asks about security, but then if you actually look at the security that is in system, it's typically very weak, which is quite surprising, right? Yeah. And uh, you know there are lots of reports of uh, <laughs> you know the security holes that are found because you know sometimes even basic security isn't used. So we think that you know, the, the, the basic building blocks are there. Uh, some innovation is required in order to have scalability, as I mentioned before. Uh, but then you know it would be in terms of the end user more a matter of adopting and embracing proper security approach as opposed to just saying yeah security is important for us. All right, so now, well, before closing this session, um, there's another uh, technology that I want to talk to you about, which is uh, 5G. Uh, yep. What do you see as being the role played uh, by 5G in uh, industrial edge AI? Yeah, so 5G uh, will have uh, an important role, and why? So let me make a step back again. So what were we doing a few years ago? A few years ago, I mean, when deploying on industrial plant, we weren't using necessarily 4G, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi, I mean, it's very fragile uh, to electromagnetic um, uh, interference. So it is sufficient to have something that moves around with electricity, right? And uh, I mean, it's a mess. And so we were already partnering with some telco provider to have private 4G deployment, okay? Now 5G makes that easier. So that's already interesting. 5G adds quite a few of QS, okay? Uh, and reduces latency, 
which is also very interesting for us. And more importantly, if you think about what I was mentioning before about our ability to decentralize and decide you know, where you have the computations, where you have the storage and so on and so forth, in a private or even in a non-private 5G infrastructure, all of a sudden you will have edge server that are provided by your telco operator where you can deploy logic. And so we have use cases in which we will have Xeno routers on the border of the network, okay? And you will be able you know, to then provision storages there to provision, uh, we didn't discuss about how we, what we do with computation, but I will just you know, make it as a between parentheses because that will take an entire podcast. Yeah. But I mean, if everyone has, has grasped the fact that Xeno gives you this like fabric from the, the data center to the device, on top of Xeno, we have built a data flow programming framework, okay? That again, you can provision uh, as if it was, I mean, let me say, as a very lightweight Kubernetes from the cloud to the device, okay? okay. And it's multiple and it's independent of the programming language, by the way. But again, so um, uh, the, 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 the ability of having edge server and uh, with our technology, the ability, the ability of leveraging those edge server for keeping communication local, if I have mobility, uh, we have this concept of session migration to ensure that I always have you know, higher, higher level session with the closest router you know, physically to me. Um, and the ability of, again, if I need to trigger computation, having this computation that are the closest possible, again, one hop away. I mean, that's, that's a huge potential for next generation application, whether they are, you know, even if we forget about autonomous car driving, um, but just even driver assistance, it's quite powerful. Because let me give an example. Suppose you have an electric car, right? If you do lots of computing and communication on your car, I mean, you're going to use lots of battery for, uh, for, for the computation yeah. as opposed to for driving, right? And so in a urban situation, typically what you would want to do is to offload most of the uh, driver assistance or advanced driver assistant to close by infrastructure. And 5G provides you with an ideal uh, architecture to do that because you have the low latency and you have one hop away the edge um, server. And again, you know, with the granularity of cells that you have in, in 5G, that's quite interesting. But now, you know, suppose we are both here in Paris, downtown Paris, this will work. But if we say, hey, you know, it's snow, last week was winter break, let's go on the Alps to ski. I mean, as you get out of Paris and you get toward the Alp, won't be the same, right? So if you want yeah. to have the same level of driver assistance, some of those computation that you were offloading to the edge infrastructure will have to be unloaded on your car, uh, which is all right, right? Um, but again, you understand that you really need an infrastructure that allows you to really exploit the best of what is around you. And what is around you, if you're moving, is highly, highly dynamic. And so I think that the combination of what, you know, in terms of infrastructure 5G makes available, in terms of latency allows, and in terms of QoS makes it possible, plus some of the technology that we are building supports very well this kind of use cases. Oh, okay, yeah, so that is very well explained. All right, so, well, in conclusion, uh, uh, could you tell us uh, a bit more about uh, maybe the team behind Zeta Scale, or if you have any parting words for us? Yeah, so I think that the team, uh, I mean, we, we like to define ourselves technology Jedi, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we are all passionate about technology, and um, I mean, uh, I think we all have a passion for you know, technology and elegance. What do I mean with that? I, I think that comes a little bit old, maybe from, uh, from our um, you know, traditions, because in our tradition, you know, the symbol of engineer is Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, that's mostly European tradition, right? And Leonardo da Vinci, used to say that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, right? Yeah. So our aim is really to make it possible to build technology you know, that look and are as simple as possible for the user and uh, embed most of the magic under the engine, okay? 
And uh, you know, I think people that uh, use our technology will will uh, you know we, will appreciate that. We make lots of effort to make sure that the user experience is as good as possible. That uh, you know things are as simple as they can be, because you know there is sometimes some inherent complexity. But we try to you know work very hard in making sure that we come up with orthogonal primitives with good composability. Um, and again, I mean, you know, we we are very happy to do that because in the end, you look at what you've done, you know, and it looks elegant and you see that people learn it very quickly. Uh, they they do, you know, fewer mistakes because the every, there is some good consistency, right? And they can focus on adding value in their, in their business as opposed to try to scratch their head and trying to understand, you know, how to use something. So as a company, you know, we are very innovative company. I think 90% of our technical staff holds a PhD, okay? Mm-hmm. I think that's almost unheard of. I think not even in Google, you have those numbers, yeah. <laughs> but that's us, okay? That's yeah. how we have always been. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, we really want to make the difference, but the difference in a good way, okay? Uh, really helping, you know, this, this domain take off and uh, and making the difference with great technology. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Now, uh, Angelo, thank you so much for joining us today on the Fourth Generation Podcast. So this is where we uh, come to a close and uh, wish you all the best in your endeavors with Zeta Scale and many other projects that you're pursuing. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure and uh, well, see you soon. Okay, Take thanks. care. Bye. Bye, bye-bye.